So let me continue where we stopped yesterday. Yesterday I talked about the nature and character of world faiths, the six features that they share, also about world faiths' numerical growth and their political public assertiveness. I've noted also that this is not this kind of resurgence of faiths, of religions, was not what was necessarily expected by advocates of secularization, by many people, in fact. The idea was that faith, for one, is just plain wrong, and since it's wrong, uh, the light of reason will dispel uh, the darkness of error. But I think more importantly, the idea was that religions, that faiths are superfluous, that there are other things that will do things that religions do, and religions will therefore disappear. There are kind of primitive explanations of reality, and once the real ones are there, we will no longer need religious ones, that religions are primitive technologies. Once that we have proper technologies, we won't need religious technologies. Um, and much of the contest between religion and our religion concerns just these two functions of faiths. Their ability to explain functioning and development of the world as a whole, and also of its various elements. And their power to manipulate the world for human benefit. Do religions explain anything, or are religious explanations primitive substitutes for true scientific ones? Why would you ride in a Viking ship if you can take a Boeing 737 or something like that, right? Do blessings and miracles enhance and repair life, or are there they make-believe technologies to be replaced by those that actually do work? Now, to put the contest between religion on the one side and science and technology on the other side in these terms, it presumes that faiths, that religions, like science and technology, primarily ex aim at explaining and manipulating the world. The dispute between our religionists and religionists is then about whether religion or science do a better job of explaining and manipulating, or you can maybe put it this way, whether science will ever offer a fully satisfactory explanations of the world and whether technology will advance sufficiently to eliminate the need for divine intervention. You see how it's a contest for the same territory that needs to be occupied. Now debates framed in this way, in these terms, are vigorous today, but I think that they are partly misplaced, misdirected. They leave out of consideration the most important function of world religions. Augustine's Confessions, one of the most influential texts of any religion, opens with the following very famous line that you all know. You move us to delight in praising you, writes Augustine, praying to God, you have formed us for yourself, and our hearts are restless till they find rest in you. This, or some version of this, is the basic sentiment at the heart of all world faiths. Whether they speak of God, like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, or not, like Buddhism. With our feet firmly planted in ordinary realities, our hand is always reaching, not for the stars, but beyond the stars, into the transcendent realm. These faiths, religions, claim that stretching out to the divine realm isn't something human beings do or do not do, depending on whether they are religiously inclined or not, whether they are religiously musical, as some people put it. Reference to transcendence is not an add-on to our humanity. You know, humans come in generic way and some people have these or those add-ons and we, peculiarly religious people, have a religious add-on to our humanity. The claim of religious, of world faiths is that this is not an add-on to humanity, but rather that it defines us 
as human beings. Now step back, and then if you ask yourself, you take this position, what's your relationship to secularization going to be? Secularization theories are predicated mostly on the idea that human beings are generically irreligious, and then you have to explain why some of them embrace religion. But if you take this position, that we are, as human beings, already open to, toward and searching for transcendence, then what you need to explain is our religion rather than religion. And that shifts the whole explanatory framework. I tend to think that we find ourselves in this other situation, namely that we are structurally made in such a way that we are restless until we find our rest in God, and therefore that we are by very nature, quote unquote, religious. Now, when we come to rest in God, when we come to love God and surrender to God in faith, to formulate the matter in Christian terms, the relation to God becomes the axis of our lives. It shapes how we see ourselves as persons. It shapes how we relate to others. And it shapes what goods we pursue in life. For the world fades, life lived on the flat plane of this worldliness. That kind of life, it's caged, it's hollow, it's light. You will, some of you will realize in these words, caged, hollow, and light, uh, echoes of Max Weber, T.S. Eliot, and Nietzsche. To be free, full, and flourishing, life must be lived in relation to the divine, which gives meaning and orientation to all our mundane endeavors. That's a disputed claim, of course, but it is the main claim world religions make. That's their reason for existence, in fact, I would say. So from the perspective of religions, their central challenge, so let me put it in first person plural, our central challenge isn't, or it shouldn't be, to gain a competitive advantage over science and technology, or at least not to lose some share of the market. World religions don't stand or fall with the ability to deliver more and better worldly goods to more people than do science and technology goods like health and longevity, the necessities and conveniences of life, or explanations of how the world and things in it function. The world religions stand and fall, Christian faith stands and falls, I think, with its ability to connect people to God, to the transcendent realm, so that humans can truly flourish, so that in their successes and failures, they can find genuine fulfillment and lead lives worthy of human beings, lives marked by contentment, lives marked by solidarity. This, I would argue, is what Buddha, what Hebrew prophets, what Jesus, what Muhammad, each in distinct way, were ultimately all about. Seen from the Anglo world faith, scientific explanations do not negate the transcendent goal of human life, and technological advances do not make faith itself redundant. Rather, the transcendent goals give scientific exploration and technological innovation truly human purpose. My argument is that faiths are that Christian faith is above all not so much about explanation of reality or manipulating it, but about purposes and goals of God's goals for our lives. Now, there are many reasons why faiths are alive and assertive in a scientifically and technologically rapidly advancing globalized world with astounding rates of wealth creation and, I should add, abysmal inequalities in wealth distribution. For instance, many billions perhaps have not benefited much from, from uh, adva such advances. Faith offers them consolation in suffering. The rapid pace of change leaves some with the sense of being caught in the swirling storms. And for them, faith provides orientation and certainty. Some are overwhelmed by the possibilities and seduction of consumerism. Faith disciplines their desires so they can care well for themselves and for others. Some are victims of systemic injustices. Faith gives them motivation to struggle against injustice and assurance that justice will ultimately triumph. Some experience erosion of local cultures 
and faith associated with a culture provides them with a sense of cultural identity. World religions do all these things and do, they do many more things, some of these things nasty and some of them uh, rather helpful. And that's the kind of ambivalence of all world faiths, as a matter of fact. And that's partly why people embrace them. But I want to contend that in all these things, and in addition to them, world religions, each in its own way, and non-reducible either to one another or to their alleged common core, all world faiths as distinct things, attend to the structural restlessness of, human, of the human heart by offering means to connect to the transcendent realm. That's the critical source of their vitality and assertiveness. Let me stop here for a moment. If what I'm saying here is true about other faiths as well as Christian faith, I think that provides a good reason for not simply engaging in disputes about the truth and falsity of each of these faiths, but also setting some common goals. Because among the world faiths, we share certain interests. And these interests that we share, interest in transcendence, ought not to occlude, be occluded by differences of those faiths themselves. So the point that I'm making, larger point that I'm making here, is that globalization isn't making world faiths disappear. What it is, though, doing, it's transforming them. And the full account of transformation of world faiths as situated within globalization processes, I think that would be roughly coextensive with the sketch of history of world faiths over the last few centuries. I will focus here on the two major transformation, one that concerns religion's relationship to the state and the other that concerns their relationship to economy. Now, there's obviously also a third major transformation, and it concerns the faith's relationship to the environment. The whole ecological issue, which I think is a very important one, ought to be attended to. I won't be attending to it. Uh, somebody else will have to do that. Indeed, people, uh, important work is being done on that issue. So the two next sections of my lecture concern religion and state, and then religion and economy. Globalization, and by globalization I mean kind of increasing inter, not just interconnectivity of all on a single globe, but also increasing interdependence, so that if you rock the boat in one place, it's going to rock uh, the other place, so that the destiny of all human beings is intertwined. And these two, interconnectedness and interdependence, are tied also by a very rapid uh, pace of change and the experience of the world as one. Roughly, that's what I mean by globalization. Globalization or the processes of globalization are transforming the relationship of world religions to the state. When a religious community is coextensive with the society, then faith can serve or religion can serve to integrate the society to provide its government with legitimizing ideology. Religion, the moral self-understanding of society, and the state they align and the political entity is integrated. I'm just reading a biography of, uh, of King David, written by my, my colleague, Joel Baden. And uh, in this book, he's, 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 he was talking about why did David get the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem? Here's the reason why he got it to Jerusalem, because he needed to integrate political rule and religious belonging into a single, single unity, right? That would be a typical example of, of the thing that I'm describing here. Now, for millennia, bo millennia, both primary and secondary religions served that purpose. They functioned as, what one might say, political religions. But when multiple faiths or multiple varieties of the same faith come to coexist within the boundaries of a society, no single faith can articulate and celebrate the link of political society with a transcendent order, and no single faith can serve to integrate society as a whole. And we know that after Protestant Reformation, there was a fissure in the Western uh, Christ Christendom, and then the, 
Uh, and then it, it led to a slow decoupling, gradual decoupling of society from a particular religion. Progressive globalization, marked as it is by an unprecedented flow of commerce, ideas, and peoples across national borders, is transforming mono-religious societies into societies with multiple, multiple forms of religion and our religion existing side by side. Now, the connection between a given religion and a political society is weakening everywhere, and some nation, in some nations, it is altogether non-existent. Now, I know that immediately you're going to contest what I've now said, right? Now, I'll, I'll do it for you. <laughs> So, uh, so that we can have a, I can have a debate with, my, with myself. I think also that partly as a result of globalization and partly in reaction to secular nationalism, movements are afoot in all world faiths to reassert dominant position, their dominant position in the society. Buddhists in Sri Lanka, for instance, are a very good example. Unity of Sinhalese culture, language and culture, and the teachings of Buddha uh, are foundation of Sinhalese uh, nationalism. Religious Zionists, for instance. Or in some ways, also the Christian right in the United States connects the national identity uh, of nation with Christian identity. Probably the most... Uh, most important example of that is the so-called political Islam. Um, faith's attempt, Islam, attempt of Islam to exert influence over the all spheres of life. If you read somebody like Syed Qutb in his book Milestones, you can then see his program articulated in the phrase, uh, famous Muslim phrase, there's no God but God. Consequence of there's no God but God means no sovereignty except God's, no law except God's, no authority of one man over another as the authority in all respects belongs to God. So God is the one, it's a kind of theocratic state, right? You have the unity between politics and religion in the, within the single space. You can see these things going on, and in some uh, places like the Middle East right now, as a result of recent wars, you have gradual um, emptying of those spaces of Christian population and therefore creation of mono-religious societies where there were none before. All of these tendencies are present in the world today. Um, uh, reassertion of the sense that we ought to control, the religions ought to control the whole political space. But I think that's a deeply problematic um, uh, attempt and we should uh, have no part in it. I think it's very, very much mistaken. First, the aspired dominance of faith ends up as de facto subservience. Faiths become tools in the hands of the powers that be. I think that's the history of faith's religion's association with politics. We try to come close to power. When we come close to power, we think we are close to exerting uh, social power. In the end, we end up being tools uh, in the, of the powers that be. Second, faith, faiths or religions pay for the, uh, for the bad bargain with the loss of identity. As I have noted earlier in the previous lecture, as secondary religion, world religions are cultural systems distinct um, from the state, and they form transcultural communities, marking ethnocultural boundaries, integrating political entities, and legitimizing governments is not what these religions, as originally conceived, are about. They transcend ethnocultural boundaries, and they address human beings qua human beings. They introduce fissure into political societies and build bridges to outsiders because they apply the same moral code to insiders and outsiders. And they stand at the critical distance from governments, seeking to align them with the transcendent norms. Close ties to collective representations of social unity, that's a cuckoo's egg in the nest of world faiths. When they see themselves as expressing the moral unity of the nation, world religions distort themselves and betray some of their signature features. And that signature feature is alignment of religion, universal values, not the particular social values, and individuals. Finally, 
Attempts at alignment with the state aren't just compromising the identity of world faiths, they're also underwriting violence. As I've said yesterday, I think it was in discussion, I think that the main reason of religious violence is precisely alignment of religion with the political powers that, that be. Then religions turn into tools of the state's deployment of its own power. So my argument would be this, and this is um, also controversial, I'm sure. Everything, just, just but everything I say here is controversial. So, um, well, anyway, here it is. When it comes to religion's relation to society and political power, globalization is a friend of religions, not their enemy. World religions are the original globalizers, the first ideologies to formulate the idea of the unity of humanity. Over the centuries, they largely compromised that vision by aligning themselves with particular political societies and their states. But their success in spreading through whole populations, sometimes with the power of the sword, was at the same time a failure to stick to the original vision. Now, by generating multi-religious societies, globalization offers world faiths an opportunity to return to themselves, to be means of worshiping, and here I'm not quoting Nietzsche, a cosmopolitan God, a God for everybody, at home everywhere, a God impartial to friend and foe, to be carriers of universal visions of human flourishing, distinct from any particular political society and relating to all people as human beings, whether they are political insiders or political outsiders. It's a universalist vision that these faiths embody, Christian faith certainly does. Now, strong tendencies to see themselves in such terms are evident, this would be my argument, in all world, world faiths, particularly in Buddhism and Christianity. Now, if Olivier Roy, this argument in globalized Islam correct, is correct. This is also true of Islam. Muslims increasingly live in religiously pluralistic societies. You have internal pluralization of uh, majority Muslim societies. And also, significantly, one third of all world Muslims live as minorities in non-Muslim nations. So Islam's link to specific territories is being severed. Islam's link to political, particular political order is also being severed. Not surprisingly, people increasingly embrace Islam as the universal faith of a transnational community at whose center is individual reappropriation of Islamic symbols, arguments, rhetoric, and norms. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning here Islam is that if my case cannot be made with regard to Islam, it can't be made, <laughs> right? It's a, it's a bad case that I'm, uh, that I'm making because if you have Islam that's, that's fundamentally linked to political societies, we will have a, a world faith cannot participate in the kind of project that I am describing here. Um, Objection can be made that what I'm sketching here is a kind of a Christianized version of, uh, of Islam, and we can discuss that issue. As I've said earlier, I'm reading world faiths through Christian lenses. I'm hoping that I'm not distorting them, but I'm finding something that's actually there and retrieving, uh, retrieving that. And the long, I think, um, and very powerful presence of Sufi Islam speaks also and goes also in the same direction as what I'm suggesting here. So now the question is, well, will these individually chosen faiths appropriate to a globalized world remain private and marginal? And in some cases they will, I think. For some people, of course they will. There will be just a way of personal way of life, of communal practice, um, personal spirituality, helping each person's unique search for centeredness and meaning. But also, decoupled from the state, world religions need not be privatized. Indeed, that's not what they, it is what's happening. Emancipation of the state from faith doesn't spell the end of political influence of faith, in part because of the globalization and because of the democratic ideal. 
um, witnessing, uh, we are witnessing the public assertiveness of just such individually chosen and personally appropriated faiths. Exhibit number one, a religious right in this country. Many other exhibits can be given. The great challenge of world faiths, world religions today, is to give up the self-betraying, impossible, and violence-inducing dream of controlling public life. That means for Christianity as well. In meeting that challenge, globalization is their ally. It is helping faiths to free themselves from the false alternatives of either being personal but publicly inconsequential or being publicly significant but politically totalitarian. Globalization is opening up space for faiths to be personally appropriated, publicly engaged, and politically pluralistic at the same time. I think faiths have resources to enter that space. Question is, will they? Question is, will we? Now, faith and economy. In regard to faith's relation to political community and power, globalization is nudging world faiths to return to their original vision. <clears throat> but with regard to faith's relation to health, wealth, longevity, and fertility, globalization is conversely luring them to betray their original vision. Globalization is transforming the relationship of world religions to economy. As I noted earlier, world faiths affirm and support ordinary flourishing. God blessed Job's worldly pursuits and protected him from harm. That's why Job was, we are told in the Bible, the greatest of all the people in the East. When I read these lines about Job being greatest of all people in the East, I'm trying to compare him to somebody around here, and I think about Warren Buffett. Buffett. Kind of the, <laughs> Job was the Warren Buffett uh, of, of his time, right? <laughs> So that there's a kind of positive relationship between God and, 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 and wealth in, in Job's case and all these other aspects uh, of flourishing uh, life. But world religions subordinate, as I've argued, ordinary flourishing to transcendent goals. Attachment to God and Job's own integrity and obedience to God's commands mattered to Job more than did wealth and fertility, more even than health, more even than life itself. So it is in different ways in all world faiths. Now in the early stages of globalization, or at least the last phase of globalization, at the beginning of its market-driven phase, faiths play a critical role in shaping the economy, at least according to some accounts. And you will be not surprised now to hear the world of Max Weber mentioned. He argued that uh, early capitalism drew some of its spirit, the innerworldly asceticism that imposed discipline both in work and consumption from faith. Faith's boost to the economy occurred though in the framework of the primacy of transcendent goals. Following the words of the, words of the apostle, 17th century Protestants considered godliness their main gain and material wealth, its consequence, a sign of God's favor, or at least so they tell us in their writings, <laughs> right? But it's significant that they say that, right? It's significant, you'll see, because it's gonna be inverted pretty soon and people aren't gonna be saying that anymore. <laughs> so at least they felt this as a claim upon their, their lives, whether and to what extent they acted accordingly may be slightly different matter. But this relationship between godliness and wealth wasn't stable. Godliness as gain, wealth as sign. That's the Puritan idea, right? It was always in danger of flipping into wealth as gain, godliness as means, which is a position which Apostle Paul explicitly rejected, or Apostle who wrote 1 Timothy, or writer of 1 Timothy, so that you know that I'm not uh, from the hick country of theological <laughs> world uh, who doesn't know that First Timothy might not have been written by Apostle Paul. Okay. <laughs> because world faiths don't set ordinary life in opposition to transcendence, but rather in the name of transcendence affirm the goodness of ordinary life, 
The temptation to turn faith into maidservant of economy was ever present. Over the four, past four centuries or so in the West, it often became irresistible. For many, concern with enhancing ordinary life gradually triumphed over attachment to transcendent goals. Today, much of engagement of faiths with economy is less about situating economy or business life, economic life, um, situating the economy in a human life whose goal is determined with reference to the transcendent realm and more about the contribution of faiths that they make to economic progress, less about situating our economic life in the context of transcendent goals of human life and more about contribution of faith to economic progress itself. Let me illustrate this. This is a huge and major shift often unmarked, I think, un uncommented on. Religious advocates of free market, and you can see lots of books published by folks like this. I'm not adverse to some of the endeavors. Religious advocates of the free market are keen on showing that faiths have resources essential for the market economy to function well. And then there are a series of books, many, many written on this, that market economy needs virtues, trust, discipline, work, hope, and religions provide them. They supply spiritual capital to complement the requisite material, financial, and other social capital. That's the serious advocates of free market economy. Now, neo-charismatic preachers, representatives of the prosperity gospel, promise that God will both empower people so they can make themselves prosperous, and then, here I'm quoting an extreme case, according to a proven wealth transfer system, even transfer the wealth of the wicked to them. Right? Um, that's a quote. <laughs> But you, you see again how the orientation is of faith's role in securing wealth. Even adherents of world religions who reject the market economy and embrace a more socialist vision often link faith tightly to ordinary flourishing. Many don't object to the primacy of material abundance, but to the means of achieving it, competitiveness and commodification. And they... Um, and they don't reject uh, so much, or they, they, they don't relativize the importance of wealth in the scheme of a human life, but they bemoan its inequitable distribution. So it's a way you get to wealth and how you distribute wealth that's problematic, but not in any way wealth itself is not taken up as an issue. As I've heard uh, one theologically minded uh, representative of such theology says, but you know, it's not a problem that people have swimming pools. The problem is that not everybody has them. Uh, you know, so <laughs> everybody should have a swimming pool, right? And so, so that expresses this basic idea that uh, issue is distribution, but wealth as such is not thematized in its relationship to transcendent goals or as a possible site of or as a possible expression of idolatry. Now, the interesting connection in the, in the New Testament that happens between wealth and idolatry, I think merits exploration, especially in the context of today. Now, I don't want to suggest that in any of these examples, any, I gave three examples, faith isn't functioning merely as means to material well-being. There are other functions of faith that are recognized, but in all of them, Material well-being has primacy. With immense vigor, imagination, and success on the whole, I think, globalization proceeds under the assumption that what truly matters are things of ordinary life. Health, longevity, good and abundant food, many conveniences, and the pleasures that they give. Fates are pulled into the vortex of market-driven globalization offering themselves as means of achieving globalization's goals. Globalization relieves the pressure on world's faiths to betray themselves with regard to the state, but globalization increases the pressure on world faiths to betray themselves with regard to the economy. Market-driven globalization is tempting faiths to give up on their own deepest, 
and most salutary insight and concern. What is that most salutary insight and concern? That they are about an account of the good life whose focal point transcends the flat plane on, of mundane existence and its concern for ordinary flourishing. To succumb to this temptation is to give up on the most important contribution world religions can make in a globalized world, namely to press the questions of the character of truly flourishing life and of the ultimate goal of all our desires and loves. Now, this isn't a new temptation, right? I think my argument is that today's globalization accentuates that temptation. I think that temptation is as old as the old people of Israel, at least we have it, as we have it recorded in, uh, in, in Old Testament. You will recall the words that Moses said to the children of Israel at the end of 40 years of wilderness wandering. You will recall also that these same words is the ones which Jesus, who was weakened by 40 days of fasting, hurled at the tempter in self-defense. What are these words? One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The mother of all temptations, equally hard to resist in abundance and want, that mother of all temptation isn't to serve false gods, as monotheists tend to think. The mother of all temptations is to believe and act as if human beings lived by bread alone. I don't want to transgress into the domain of interpretation of the Old Testament, but I think that I could plausibly interpret Genesis 3 to make the same point. Serving false gods or turning the one true God into a mere bread provider, which amounts, I think, to the same thing, Serving false gods is the consequence of succumbing to this grand temptation. When we live by bread alone, there's never enough bread, not even when we make so much of it that most of it rots away. When we live by bread alone, someone always goes hungry. When we live by bread alone, every bite we take leaves a bitter aftertaste and the more we eat, the bitterer the taste. When we live by bread alone, we always more want more and better bread, as if the bitterness came from the bread itself and not from our living by bread alone. Now, I could continue with the analogy, but the point is clear. Living by mundane realities and for them alone, we remain restless, and that restlessness in turn contributes to competitiveness, social injustice, and the destruction of the environment, as well as constitutes a major obstacle to more just, generous, and caring personal practices and social arrangements. Alone, by bread alone, is a key word in this passage. Bread alone, maybe bread and games, <laughs> in our context uh, here, as in Romans as well, context. Bread alone, right? For we also live by bread, also by entertainment we do live, right? So some fun one ought to have, right? We live also by bread, and without bread, all of us would be dead. Still, without the divine word, without transcendence, justice for all, love of neighbor, we shrivel and we shrivel even when we are in overdrive. We fight and we destroy, we perish. The word is the bread of life, and it gives abundant life, as it is written both in the Torah and in the Gospels. Deuteronomy, uh, I'm sorry, uh, globalization, both in its discarded socialist form and its presently dominant capitalist form, stands above all for bread, the creation and improvement of worldly goods. Its propensity is to proceed as if the word were not the source of abundant life, and to keep our sights fixed on multiplying the bread. World religions, on the other hand, stand explicitly for the word, or more precisely, for varieties of competing, sometimes contradictory understandings of the word. 
One might expect that the propensity of world religions may be to make us forget about the daily bread and flee into divine realms of feasting upon pure word. But that's not the case. The temptation to which world religions all too often succumb is to devolve into mere instruments of pro procuring bread and into weapons in mundane struggles over bread. Thank you very much. Thank you.